Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I stand today with the unanimous consent of my colleagues from all four parties represented in this House. The Progressive Conservative Party, the Liberal Party, the People's Alliance Party, and the Green Party. I address this House with humble thanks to each of them for allowing me this opportunity to say farewell to this chamber, in which it has been my absolute privilege to serve as the representative for the constituents of Southwest Miramichi and Southwest Miramichi Bay de Vin for nearly combined 11 years. There remains honor and integrity in this House, Mr. Speaker, and in elected offices. The fact that each and every one of my colleagues has agreed to allow me this opportunity to speak is evidence of that. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my constituents for their election of me through four successive elections in 2010, 2014, 2018, and most recently 2020, my constituents placed their trust in me, and I will be forever grateful for their support. I think, Mr. Speaker, that the voters of Miramichi understood and understand that I was never going to be Fredericton's voice at home. They knew that I would never accept as my role to blindly endorse decisions of government here in the capital and then attempt to justify them at home in communities in Miramichi. I've always been my own man, cut from my own cloth, as some would say, and I've been a product of my own environment my whole life. And I think that this job has really brought out um, that part of me at the best of times. But rather, Mr. Speaker, my constituents have understood and agreed that I was to be their voice here in Fredericton and in this chamber, that my job was to advocate for them in Fredericton, not the other way around. This understanding is fundamental to my constituents, to me, and it's understanding the Miramichi region, if anyone is listening. While on the topics of giving thanks and with your indulgence, I must recognize and thank some others which is, after all, one of the primary purposes of this address today. As we all know, being a member of the Legislative Assembly comes with many sacrifices. Our families, our spouses, our parents, and our children are often the ones who sacrifice much more than we do. We do miss many special occasions and arrive late for even more. It's not just special occasions we miss, Mr. Speaker, we also lose many opportunities to simply enjoy the company of our loved ones on uneventful evenings or weekends. As with the families of every member in this House, my wife and children have supported me without question. They have supported me without regard for their own desire to have me home and more present in their lives because they believed in my role and understood what a member of the House has to do. It's a part of the job and we accept that once we put our name on the ballot. Thanks does not seem to be enough. Even my dedicated love for each of them does not even seem to be enough. But Mr. Speaker, to my wife Shannon and to my children, who are now becoming young adults, River, Roman, Leah, and Meadow Rose, thank you for your unconditional love and support of me over the years. Thank you for understanding not just what I do, but why it's that I do it. Thank you for giving me the strength to face each and every day with new courage and new conviction to make this province and this country a better place. There are so many individuals who have helped me over the years, all of whom deserve mention, but I would be remiss not to mention just a few. To the previous MLAs and candidates for our party in my region, Brent Taylor, Norm Betts, Andy Dawson, Donnie Long, Kevin Price, Sterling Hambrook, and George O'Donnell. I stand on the shoulder of giants. You left a region and an association which allowed me to get elected and stay there for 11 years. <laughs> Benedict Donovan, or Ben, or Benny, my campaign manager, my mentor, my friend. Lately, I take him on the side-by-side -side for runs up through Dungarvan. But you know, Ben Donovan was my first supporter and still holds the number one position, campaign manager. He's never let that one go. 
He's still my campaign manager today, and I, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish anything without him at the front of it. Andy Hawks. Andy was the former mayor of the village of Blackville. While a latecomer to our community, he was welcomed with open arms and respected for his integrity and knowledge. Andy passed away recently, but this speech would have a hole in it if he were not mentioned. He was a gentle man, a wise man, highly intelligent and intellectual, but he was a great mentor to have, and I felt certainly honored to have him on our team, and he's dearly missed. Insert, Mr. Speaker, I have to insert the rest of my board members. Billy O'Donnell. Billy served as a great friend and often as my bodyguard. Leonard Brynton, Alan Washburn, Beaton and Linda Coughlin and their son Tommy, Jill Brophy, Bobby Betts, Jill Stewart, Trudy Underhill, Dorothy and Wallace Calford, Catherine Williston, Jean and Ann Kelly, Susan Brophy, of course, has been my constituency assistant for for nine years and certainly has as much to put up with as anyone working for me, of course, no less, but she's done a fabulous job. There's also some people who have passed away who've been very integral parts of our team over the years. Kendall Astle, Ruth Flett, Tanya McKay, Keith Preston, Gail Kingston, and the late Robert Stewart. Sean, Mike, and Janice Morrison, Mr. Speaker, the Miramichi has no better friends than the Morrison family. They are passionate and community-minded family who are fiercely loyal and actually enjoy hard work. They contribute in great ways to our democracy and have become better friends than I could have ever asked for. Chief Roger Augustine. Before I became Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, I studied Canadian history and knew a little bit about our history. But uh, Chief Roger had been grooming me for that job, I think, since I was about 30 years old. <laughs> I never thought that I'd have that job, but he was certainly spending his, his free time grooming me and trying to teach me everything that he could about First Nations and the culture. So I owe a lot of gratitude to Chief Roger because I probably, I had a pretty good foundation when I got there. So thank you, Chief Roger. Well, Alan. Dr. Jim Parrott. Doc was my first elected mentor. He was larger than life, strong-willed, firm in his convictions, colorful, hot-tempered, unconventional. I don't know why we instantly liked each other, because we had nothing in common. And <laughs> he saw something in me that he liked. I think he saw a little bit of himself in there. In all seriousness, Mr. Speaker, he was the best friend a person could ask for, and I do miss him every day. Uh, Premier Blaine Higgs. Mr. Speaker, much may be inferred about the relationship between myself and the current Premier, but as I close this chapter of my life, it's important to me to stand in this house and thank him for the trust he placed in me when he named me to Executive Council. Being the first ever uh, standalone Minister of Aboriginal Affairs for the province of New Brunswick was uh, a great honor and I appreciated it to this day. Our Premier is well intentioned and a good man and New Brunswickers are well served by his stable leadership in these troublesome times. Before I move on and thank some other people, I need to mention a few people, Greg Davis that I worked with Obviously, all of you here today, all of my colleagues, I've worked with some of you for 11 years, some of you for two, some of you for four, some of you for eight. Um, you've all made an impact in my life and in my career, and I, I certainly appreciate it, every single one of you. And I do have to mention Wes McLean. We went to university together, and uh, we've been friends for, for many years, so I'm really excited to be able to work with him these past few years. And um, last but not least, To breathe here, you know. Sometimes, um, sometimes good friends are hard to come by. And in politics, they're harder because we're all type A personalities. We're all doers. We all want to be leaders. The majority of us are in our own right. And 
it's very difficult to find my best friends today are the are the friends that I had when I was five years old. Eric Walls, April Walls, Cheyenne Gunter. These were my best friends when I was this high. Jill Brophy, another one. But in politics, you meet so many good people, and they're all good people. You're all good people, I think, for the most part. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it's truly hard to find true friends as you get older, because most of us, if we look back on our lives, the best friendships we ever had were like when we're 12 or eight or something. We, we're, we can all relate to that. But I want to thank um, Nicole Carlin. She's been my best friend these past couple of years, and I had three or four classes with her in 1997 in university. I used to sing at the bar. I remember seeing her as a, as a, as a waitress. But getting to work with her and getting to know her these past couple of years, she's been a real true friend, and one of the moments that communication people never get enough thanks. Their job is difficult. I remember doing national interviews on a subject line of systemic racism. Anybody who's an MLA or public figure or anybody, when you're going on national television to talk about racism, you know, there's obviously that you get a little bit uh, nervous for something like that because so much can go wrong and you can take all of your experience and all of your knowledge and try to do the best job you can do. But she sat there with me through all of those interviews and it certainly made all of the difference for me. So, I mean, I want to thank her for that, for making me look good at probably the most difficult moments of my career, but also for being a true friend, and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, lastly, Mr. Speaker, on the topic of thanks, I would like to thank each and every Indigenous, Indigenous and First Nations citizen in the province for the privilege of having been their minister. To them, I say that while my opportunity to serve was short, it did present an opportunity, an opportunity that we seized towards truth and reconciliation. As I indicated to the chief of each and every First Nations community, while I did not have a large budget attached to the portfolio, the one thing I could offer was my sincere promise to never break their trust, never promise something I couldn't deliver on, and never mislead them. These things may seem obvious, Mr. Speaker, but given the marginalization suffered for centuries by our First Nations, which does continue today, which we see in the press with the issue in Kamloops, even these obvious fundamental understandings need revisiting. It has been known by Canadians that Canada, a country regarded around the globe as a leader in progressive thought and human rights, has failed to live up to its own standards with respect to its treatment of Indigenous peoples. The discovery last month of the remains of 215 children in Kamloops, BC has sickened and angered, some, angered all Canadians and all New Brunswickers and all of us around the country. While the discovery in Kamloops may be thousands of miles away, there is every indication that similar instances will play out across the country in the months and years to come. With this in the very front of our minds as legislators, we must give a heartfelt commitment to do better, much better than previous generations. We will be judged not by our words, but by our actions. True reconciliation is not simply a statement or a gesture but a commitment supported by behavioral change to move forward a partnership with Indigenous peoples and to, wherever possible, encourage and support their ability to reclaim their identity, culture, and their livelihoods. There was no secret to my successful relationship with First Nations, Mr. Speaker. It was simply honesty. That's all it was. We had a respect for each other. To my First Nations friends and to all our First Nations people, I say thank you. We have demonstrated that a new way is possible, that with honesty, respect, and acknowledgement of past wrongs, we can work together to build a better New Brunswick and a better Canada. And while I will no longer sit in this house, my relationship with and commitment to First Nations communities and individuals remains as strong as it ever has been. I'm only one more, I'm only more emboldened and determined to work towards real reconciliation across the province and the country. Mr. Speaker, Southwest Miramichi Bay de Vin begins where the headwaters of the Southwest Miramichi form in central New Brunswick. 
And like those waters, my constituency meanders through the communities along it, beginning in McGivney, Taxis River, Parker's Ridge and Astal Settlement. It represents rugged terrain and the families who have lived on it for generations. It continues through Boystown, Porter's Cove and Doaktown, the geographic center of our province and the homes to the world famous Woodsman Museums and Atlantic Salmon Museum. If it is true, Mr. Speaker, that the farther up the river you go, the tougher the men get, then the toughest ones live there. There is still some debate on this point within my constituency, but living in Blackville certainly place, doesn't place me too far up the river. So there's a lot more tougher people up above. It continues on through Blissfield and into Blackville, and Renews, Howard's, Pineville, the Rapids and Coryville. There, these are communities in which I was raised. The legendary Don Garvin Hooper votes here, Mr. Speaker, and I am proud to say he's an identified supporter of mine. Sometimes, when the lunar schedule allows for it, you'll even hear me hooping alongside of him. <laughs> Poet Michael Whalen wrote countless works about the people and places of this region, such as the deep and dark Dungarvan rolls along and the Dungarvan Hooper. On through Millerton, Derby and McKinleyville, Chelmsford, Barnaby River and Napin. Like the river, my constituency meanders through Northumberland County towards the bay, circling around the city of Miramichi and taking in St. Margaret's, Black River, and Bay of Ending where the river meets the bay in Hardwick, Bay St. Anne, and Escuminac, these are the communities of the proud and courageous people like Yvonne Durrell and Jackie Vautour. Each and every family here bears the scars of the great Escuminac disaster of 1959, where 22 boats and 35 lives were lost in the 50-foot waves and 100-mile-per-hour winds. A source of great personal pride, Mr. Speaker, my constituency is the Miramichi River and its bay. The Atlantic salmon and the striped bass inhabit every community in my region, and they are both dedicated constituents of mine, as I am of theirs. We have always identified the Atlantic salmon as a conservative vote, Mr. Speaker, and while the bass has voted for me on occasion, with recent reports that they are now eating their own, I am afraid they have returned to their liberal roots. <laughs> <laughs> we must catch all these striped bass, you know. <laughs> Over the past decade, people have asked me, understanding that I represent the largest electoral district in this province, what do people in Boystown have in common with those from Bay Saint Anne? Let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, they're all Miramichiers. French, English, woodsmen, lobster fishermen, doesn't matter. They're all in there. They're all Miramichi. Mammashiers have hearts of gold and a work ethic like no other. We are resilient and overcome adversity again and again as our history demonstrates. We are firm in our convictions and are prepared to fight over them, sometimes literally, if necessary. If you find yourself in need of a real friend, Mr. Speaker, someone who will be with you when the chips are down, find a Mammashier. Mr. Speaker, it has been my absolute privilege to represent these communities and the people in them in this house for the past decade. Communities like these and the people who populate them are the backbone of our province and our country. It's no secret, Mr. Speaker, that I have recently sought and accepted the nomination for the Conservative Party of Canada for the Federal Electoral District in Miramichi Grand Lake. It's, um, this was not an easy decision for me only last year I sought and received the support of my constituents to serve another term in this House. But in the time since then, it's become clear that on a personal level and a political one, I needed a renewed purpose. As one of my colleagues perhaps put it best, I had been majoring in the minors, in his words. Now this colleague is a friend. And I chose not to take these words as a slight, because at the time he was absolutely right, but I took it instead as an inspiration. You see, Mr. Speaker, Miramichi is a real place. Northumberland County really does exist. The people who live there are hardworking and proud New Brunswickers 
who in only one generation have lost St. Thomas University, the Air Base, CFB Chatham, the majority of our railroad system, and all of our lumber and paper mills upon which our initial economy was primarily based. So the poll continues. Forest protection is on its way to Fredericton, which could be the final demise of our airport. It could be. I get that many of my colleagues never fully understood me. Some of that is my fault. And I know that sometimes I'm misunderstood because of the issues that I fight for, which seem trivial to probably the average person or MLAs from other regions, with all due respect. But to me, they are so important. So Mr. Speaker, the reason is because these issues are important to my region, which makes them important to me. Success of government and their policies have left us with nothing but small things left to fight for, like fish barriers and sometimes much smaller things. The pull of resources from the center of the province to other corners of it has really diminished the provincial um, landscape in, in this region where I live. And nobody could deny that. It's been happening for 100 years, not just the last couple of years. But upon reflection, Mr. Speaker, for the very reasons that I have remained an outsider in Fredericton, I have remained my constituents' choice to represent them here. It's because I choose them every time. But it's, be <laughs> it's because I would never and will never abandon their interests for my own political opportunity. I could never be bothered with that. I never understood that. I've always been ambitious and I've always wanted to go as far as I could go in this job, but if my constituents wanted it, and if I could wrap my head around the reasons why, then I was, gonna, I was prepared to fight for it. So I decided perhaps of ma instead of majoring in the minors, it was time to try minoring in the majors, Mr. Speaker. And I know that's a much better way. My commitment to public service and to my region and its constituents remains strong, stronger in fact than when I was first elected. My legacy in life is without question my four children, but if I can be so bold as to hope that I've left a legacy as a member of this house, I hope that I have reaffirmed if you do the hard work and always put your constituents first while remaining true to your own convictions, you will maintain the trust and respect of the voter. I shall put this theory to test, Mr. Speaker, when the next federal election is called. While this speech may in fact be farewell to this House, it is by no means the end. In the famous words of Winston Churchill, it's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning for me. I once again say thank you to this House and its members for its indulgence in granting me this opportunity to say farewell. I look forward to continuing my work and representing my region, but in a different form than this, but with every bit as much enthusiasm and passion as I've always shown as a member of the Legislative Assembly of New Brunswick. Thus, I bid this House farewell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.